So you want to get to the moon, but you'd rather go for something a little different than the standard Saturn V. <laughs> Hello everyone, Karnasa here, and you're in luck, because in this video I'll be going over 10 insane moon rockets for realism overhaul. Unlike my previous video, most of these aren't balanced for RP-1, as I didn't design them with that in mind. They will be usable in career, but the tech may be a little weird. All the craft files from this video will be uploaded to my Patreon, where you'll also be able to find craft files from For All Kerbal Kind, downloads to any music I create for my videos, and sneak peeks of videos I'm working on. Link in the description if you want to support my work and access all of these. At the end of the last video, I mentioned I'm going to be working on a tier list video rating rockets you send in to me. Submissions are now now open on Discord, but I do want to point out that any orbital capable rocket is allowed. Huh? Any tech all the way up to current day is permitted, so long as it's on the standard RP-1 Express install. One last thing before the launch vehicles, I'll be using the same payload for every one of these designs. The Apollo capsule, with the LEM as the lander. I needed to have some sort of control to compare these designs, and this combo is tried and tested once TLI has been achieved. Anyway, rockets. One of only two designs on this list that was a real life proposal, and the only rocket to actually fly, if you can even say that. The N1 was the Soviet Union's attempt at landing a person on the moon. The N1 I've designed is slightly different in that it's uprated to be able to take the CSM and LEM, as the LK lander would have been a lighter payload. This means this rocket comes in at 4,200 tons, rather than the 2,750 it would have been in real life. The design does, however, happen to be one of the cheapest on the list at 183,000 funds, but then that's most likely due to the fact that these rockets will definitely be getting a tad more outlandish. This vessel, in order to get anywhere and not just look like a Christmas tree on the pad, will use 30 NK-33 engines on the first stage, 8 NK-15V on the second, 4 NK-21s on the third, and then finally 2 NK-19 engines to propel the spacecraft to the moon. The rocket will be one of two that I showcase the land actually making it all the way, just to prove that once a craft is in orbit with about 3,150 meters per second of delta V, the Apollo CSM, which will be the same for all these missions, can then do the rest. The other example I'll show is down to flying solids to the moon was a complete b this will make this section a tad longer than the others, but I really did want to show that this will indeed work the entire way. A typical N1 would only have one NK-19 to perform TLI, however, as the Apollo lunar stack is heavier, I had to go for a couple, as otherwise I'd have overburned the engine quite considerably. Reliability on this vehicle is already quite wonky, without factoring extending an engine's burn by six minutes. Even so, the burn to the moon took quite a while. The NK-19s really don't offer an awful lot of thrust, but the upper stage, or Block G, I absolutely cannot pronounce that as it should be, is more than capable of getting a lunar encounter. Once the burn has been completed, transposition and docking takes place, so that the spacecraft is all ready for its lunar capture. I then put the vessel into a slight roll to try and mitigate boil off as much as possible, due to the power on this vessel coming from the fuel cells within the Apollo service module. One thing I should have done, but neglected to do, was make sure the rear of the vessel was pointing at the sun. That way, if the sun decides to go full aggro and send a storm on my way, the crew would have some protection offered by the service module. Alas, I forgot, and as luck would have it, my crew got completely blasted by solar radiation. Whoops. The crew made it to the moon, slightly greener now, and I perform a burn with the AJ-10-137 to capture into a low lunar orbit. After this, two crew are moved across to the LEM, which undocks and begins burning to land. Having a deeply throttleable engine and more than enough fuel, the descent is not too tricky, and a few minutes after starting the burn, the LEM has has successfully touched down. After a short stay, the craft launches again and performs a rendezvous with the CSM. The lander is attached and the crew are sent hurtling back to Earth. When returning, at least with the Apollo capsule, I find 30 to 32 kilometers a good height to aim for. Activating descent mode on the capsule to provide a lifting surface when re-entering should make the trip somewhat uncomfortable, but definitely survivable, with the capsule managing to not melt into goo from the effects of atmospheric heating. Then it's just a case of remembering to ditch the forward heat shield, prime the parachutes, and let the craft touch down safely. So there's a full mission. The N1 as a design is not too bad in terms of cost, and it certainly looks pretty good, even if I did make the rookie mistake of painting it green rather than the grey it should have been. The main issues are reliability, and if you're going for a more conventional N1, less payload to TLI, but overall really not a bad vehicle to get to the moon at all. 
Of course, I imagine you might have guessed this was coming and has been a requested short quite a lot in terms of comments I've received. It's the N1, but it's upside down. Being upside down makes it slightly more expensive in terms of cost and mass, and the vessel will cost you 200,000 funds and weighs a whopping 5,100 tons. And like the Australian from my last video, this actually isn't too terrible. Flying it upside down does mean you can't use ascent guidance though, as Megjeb really does not like this, and all the times I tried, the vehicle pulled an Astra Rocket 3.3 and ended up going sideways rather than up. This rocket uses the same engines as the previous entry, just slightly more of them, as being angled means not all the thrust they generate is going in the right direction. 36 NK33 engines make up the first stage, 10 NK15V on the second, 6 NK21 on the third, and once again just a couple of NK19s to perform TLI once the spacecraft has made it to orbit. Reliability, as with the last design, is going to be a tad rubbish. The sheer amount of engines involved with this really does not help. Although on a positive note, because there are so many of them, if only a couple fail, you should be alright. Flying this without ascent guidance can be a little tricky too, as Block G has a burn time of seven and a half minutes. The thrust to weight ratio is abysmal, and for the majority of the burn, I had to nose the spacecraft up. But still, this vehicle is once again capable of getting all that's required to low Earth orbit. More expensive and harder to fly make this design not really worth it. But still, it's kind of fun. Watch the N1 do silly things. What happens if you take an N1, remove all the Russian engines, and replace them with American ones? You get the switcheroo, of course. This vehicle is the exact same size and shape as the N1. However, all of the Russian tech has been replaced. NK33s become F1s, and J2s basically make up the rest. This is the last of the rockets on this list that takes the basic shape of the N1, and out of all three, is definitely the best in terms of capability. At 218,000 funds, it is the most expensive, as paying for efficient hydrologs is going to cost you, but this does make the rocket the lightest N1 at 3,884 tons. Not that that really makes too much of a difference due to needing the unlimited launch pad for any one of these three vehicles. Reliability of this design is considerably better, with many less points of failure having a lot fewer engines. Six F1s on the first stage, followed by eight J2s, then four, then finally a single J2 to perform TLI. I didn't check just how much the first three stages can get to low Earth orbit, but with a considerable amount of fuel left in the third stage, it's certainly going to be a lot more than just the lunar stack. So the story here is, if you want to go Soviet style, maybe pack a few American engines. And now, the Uno reverse card, the Switcheroo 2, a rocket shaped like the Saturn V, but using Soviet engines. And if using American engines on Soviet designs was good, wait till you find out how much better it is to do the other way round. First nice thing about this vessel, launching from the Cape, it's about time that an American looking rocket is actually used. I won't lie, launching three different M1 style of vehicles to begin with did look very cursed. This vehicle is the cheapest on the list, at 179,000 funds, and is also on the lighter end at 3,905 tons. Once again though, reliability will come into play, with 31 NK33 engines on the first stage being a huge hot mess at the base of the Saturn V structure. The second stage is powered by 5 NK43s, and in somewhat of a departure from the traditional N1 engines, two RD57Ms are used on the S4B tank to finalise orbit and to perform TLI. These Soviet Hydrolox engines are very efficient, and were intended to be used on upgraded versions of the N1 for further applications of the rocket. Coming with four ignitions, they are more than capable of getting to orbit, and then going further. With about 5,500 meters per second of delta V remaining in the S4RM stage, once orbit has been achieved, this vehicle once again is plenty capable of getting the Apollo capsule to orbit, and then some, making this way more efficient than your standard Saturn V. Who cares if it's slightly heavier and 10,000 funds more expensive? With this payload capability, you can start thinking of other applications, such as lunar bases or space stations with this vehicle. So there, the Saturn V with Soviet engines, actually not a bad design at all. When I launched the Australian in the last video, I got told that the Australian was a newspaper, and if I really wanted to go for something more Aussie sounding, I should have used a name like Sheila. So here is the Sheila 5, a normal Saturn 5, but going back to my most popular video on YouTube, it is of course going to be launched upside down. This vehicle will set you back 189,000 funds, and is about the same mass as a standard Saturn 5 at 3,441 tons. Having the extra engines on all three stages will do that to a craft. The setup is the same as a normal Apollo mission, 
position with F1s on the first stage, J2s on the second, and another couple of J2s on the third to get to orbit and perform a translunar injection. Obviously, the main difference here is that each stage has an extra engine to provide more thrust as upside-down rockets tend to need that. When I designed the old upside-down Saturn V, it was perfectly capable of getting to orbit using Megjeb's ascent guidance. I'm not entirely sure what went wrong with this design, but alas, for some reason, that no longer works. So once again, I had to fly this with the surface buttons on Smart ASS. A little annoying if you want to go away and put some more shrimp on the Barbie, but these are the problems we run into when doing insane moon rockets such as this. As is the case with all the upside down rockets I fly, and this will be the last one on this video, I promise, the right way up variant tends to be better. This does work and can go on to perform a lunar landing, but the added expense and the inability to be autopiloted make it a little annoying and not quite as efficient cost-wise as the standard vessel. However, this video is about insane moon rocket ideas and I feel this absolutely fits that description. Continuing on with the insane rockets, have you ever wondered what would happen if you were to place two Saturn V boosters on the side of an N1? No? Well anyway, you get this, the behemoth, so named because it's bloody big. This rocket comes in at a massive 9,646 tons, which makes it the heaviest vehicle so far by quite a long way. However, it's absolutely nowhere near the biggest rocket on this list. Maybe I should have gone for a bit of a different name. The vehicle will set you back 423,000 funds, so it is also a very expensive design, and to be honest, it doesn't offer really much more than any of the previous designs. Upon reaching orbit, it does have 1000 meters per second of delta V remaining in the block V stage, meaning it can take more than just a lunar landing mission. But at the increased cost and mass, it's not really its best application. The main reason why this really isn't the best of designs to work with is only the S1C stage on the Saturn V boosters is used. Me being a little foolish, made sure the entire boosters were fueled. That means there's a literal ton of hydrogen locks present in the S2 and the S4B stages that is currently just dead weight. I am thinking of redesigning this, however, at a later date so that all three stages of the Saturn V's are used, which should considerably raise the amount of payload this vehicle can take to low Earth orbit, and may actually make it a somewhat reasonable vessel to consider. Another issue I ran into is I could not decouple the boosters as soon as they ran out of fuel, but had to wait until the first stage of the N1 was depleted before decoupling the second stage of the N1, as the boosters had a rather nasty habit of destroying the rest of the vehicle. This was a lot of extra mass for the the core stage to carry, and made this design about as efficient as a chocolate teapot. With a few tweaks, the behemoth might be a somewhat decent design, but not for sending just a simple crude lunar landing mission. Nope, if you want to send an entire surface base all in one go, then maybe this would be the right kind of vessel for you. Moving on from the heavy to the extremely light, well, light in the grand scheme of things for this video. This, the lightweight, is possible to launch on just the 1500 ton launch pad, as the entire vessel comes in at only 1486 tons. I know there are designs out there that are much lighter than this, but this is still capable of sending the full Apollo mission, and in order to do that, I had to turn to a very powerful, unique engine. The LR129, and this engine is the only engine used on the entire launch vehicle. It's great as it has a decent amount of thrust and ISP even at sea level, and the nozzle of the engine can be extended or retracted to either increase ISP and decrease thrust, or to do the opposite of that. The rocket uses a core stage with four of these engines, accompanied by eight boosters with one engine on each. Only using Hydrolox as fuel though does get pretty costly, so even though you can save some funds on launching this from a smaller pad, the rocket itself is one of the more expensive designs at nearly 250,000 funds. Once the vessel discarded its eight boosters and was reasonably high in the atmosphere, I extended the nozzles on the core stage, as thrust was no longer a particular concern, but the jump in specific impulse was needed in order to get the Apollo capsule up to space. The lightweight, a fantastic payload fraction and good if you want to skimp out on upgrading to the unlimited pad, but it will cost you elsewhere. So I wanted to design a rocket that used Titan technology, that was still capable of getting the Apollo CSM and lander to the moon. Enter the Titan extremely big, much bigger than your typical Titan, using a 9 LR87 LH2 first stage, accompanied by four AJ260 FL solid rocket boosters. This thing can lift. 
This rocket does have a bit of a misnomer in that the AJ-260 boosters are really satin tech and I probably could have replaced them with large LR-87 boosters, but if I'm honest, I just wanted to use the really big SRBs. I mean, they're Titanic, so surely that fits the whole Titan X theme. The boosters do, however, make this a heavy launch vehicle at 7,543 tons, so definitely no getting away with the lighter pad this time, and this design will end up costing you 201,000, so putting it roughly in the middle in terms of cost, but definitely more towards the expensive end. Once the boosters have been dropped and the first stage depleted, 10 LR-91s propel the rest of the vehicle to space. Yes, 10. So quite a few more than your typical Titan. To finish off this stack, the TLI is performed by another LR-87 LH2. This time, the vacuum optimized variant, as this section of the vehicle should only be used in space. The vehicle is perfectly capable of getting to the moon and performs well. However, the cost and mass of this vehicle do mean there are better options to pick, and in all honesty, a normal Saturn V could probably do the job better. Now we're starting to get to the big leagues, and this rocket, the Solid, was one of the most painful ones to design, but I guess that's what you get when you try to make a design that only uses solid rocket motors to make it to the moon. Once at the moon, I'll still be using the Apollo capsule, but everything up to that point will be propelled by only using solid rockets. This design took about 12 different iterations to get it to a point where it would actually work. The amount of time I spent fine-tuning the amount of fuel in each stage was quite frankly ridiculous, but eventually I did get it to a point where I could make a somewhat reasonable orbit. Only using solids, I could not shut the engines down, so the Delta V had to be near perfect. Otherwise, my orbit around Earth was going to be pretty difficult to set up a lunar encounter with. So, remember the behemoth at 9,000 tons? This vessel absolutely smashes that in terms of mass, coming in at a crazy 25,000 tons, almost three times the weight. And what do you get with that? An incredibly hard mission to fly. The vessel had a habit of spontaneously combining busting when separating stages, which certainly made it not the most fun. And once again, I go back to the previous point of once a solid rocket is ignited, you ain't stopping it. This vessel is also one of the most expensive on the list at 328,000 funds. There really isn't an awful lot going for it, unless you want to have the satisfaction of saying, I got a crew to the moon only using solid rockets. And trust me, it's really not all that satisfying. To get the solid anywhere though, seven AJ-260 FLs are used on the first stage, accompanied by 12 RSRMV boosters. Those RSRMVs mean that this vehicle also isn't too tech friendly, with the node that researches those being unlocked really, really late game. The second stage consists of just two AJ-260s with a couple of large balloon tanks I added to try and fine tune the Delta V of this vessel. Adding dead weight to a rocket to bring down total Delta V was quite honestly an alien concept. Finally, to get the spacecraft into low Earth orbit, one AJ-260 FL was used on the final stage. And when I did this launch, I still had around 400 meters per second of fuel left in the vehicle after achieving orbit, which of course meant my orbit was now really quite wonky and would screw up the perfect 3,150 meters per second of delta V I had in my TLI solid stage, which being solid had to be completely used. I was able to plot out a maneuver to the moon, but I would overburn by about 70 meters per second, which when traveling all the way out to Luna is quite a huge difference. TLI begins with two Castor 120s burning to completion before being decoupled and allowing two Castor 30 rockets to finish the burn and also completely overshoot the moon. In order to get back on course, I started burning through my RCS propellant on the caster stage. This took a very long time. But eventually, I was able to get a nice close flyby, assemble the spacecraft and land the LEM on the moon once again. If you do not value your time or mental health, then this is the rocket for you. Otherwise, I'd avoid this style of design at all costs. The design that didn't want to be made and actually had me going back to my 1.10 install of Kerbal Space Program, and the second of two real life proposals, the Sea Dragon. It's kind of a big deal. I mean, it's certainly the largest of this list. My design here coming in at 27,000 tons, it's also quite expensive. 4.2 million funds expensive, making it over 10 times more expensive than any other rocket on this list. I sure hope if you go for something like this, you're offered a blank check. This vehicle also requires an additional mod in order to use, which is the real scale Sea Dragon mod. I'll put a link to that in the description, but the mod itself only uses the stock fuel system. So in order for this to work in RO, I had to go and create my own configs for the engines, which are now included on my Discord. I use data from Astronautics for the fuel, thrust and specific impulse, so hopefully the config should be somewhat accurate. Despite being absolutely ginormous, this is quite a simple design overall and only has six engines involved. Sea Dragon first stage engine, the Sea Dragon second stage engine, and four 
four auxiliary vernier engines attached to the second stage, which ignite with the first stage. Stage one uses Carolox and stage two uses Hydrolox, but it is by far the most inefficient Hydrolox engine available, with the specific impulse on the engine being completely terrible. In order to launch this from the water, I constructed a Kerbal Constructs pad and clipped it into the ocean. Ideally, only the tip of the vehicle would have been visible as it is on the show for all mankind. Unfortunately for me though, the ocean only goes so deep. So a lot of it was on display before the launch. The proposals for Sea Dragon gave it a payload rating of somewhere between 450 to 650 tons to low Earth orbit. My design here, however, wouldn't be able to get much more than the 150 ton lunar stack on top of the vessel. A bit of fine tuning of the craft might help, but really not great at lifting what it should be able to. If you have millions to spare and want to do a cool sea launch, then give this a try. But this vehicle is really not going to be useful for a standard launch, especially an RP-1. Extra configs could be written to make it more in line with the RP-1 prices, and I imagine a cost of somewhere around 500,000 to 1 million would make this somewhat useful in a career save, especially if you can end up getting around 500 tons to low Earth orbit. Still, it looks bloody cool launching from the sea. There's definitely a multitude of reasons why you wouldn't want to launch crew on a sea dragon though, and turning your kerbals into soup is pretty high up on that list. The rockets used in this video were pretty weird to say the least, and there were definitely some peculiar occurrences. Nearly every single vehicle in this video required multiple attempts of flying due to either me being a terrible pilot, a terrible engineer, the Kraken, or straight up me forgetting to stage when I needed to. So as a bonus I've decided to show some of the failed attempts now. These however don't include any footage from the testing phase as I tend to not record that. And believe me, there were a lot of redesigns over these 10 missions. There were several other ideas I had for this that I'll give honourable mentions to. The European, a rocket using only European tech. The modern, something using only cutting edge engines, and the Saturnception, launching a Saturn V on an even bigger Saturn V, but I feel that one should definitely wait for its own video in the future. And of course, any one of these designs could potentially be flipped and flown upside down. Maybe a Dragon Sea is on the cards, it's not like the normal Sea Dragon wasn't causing me enough grief already by dancing to the soothing sounds of the ocean. I'll be working on the tier list video shortly, most likely after the next episode of For All Kerbal Kind drops. So so make sure you head to Discord to submit your best and worst. I have been Karnassa and I will see you later.